This is the fifth and final tape in the series Communication Skills in Clinical Practice, a video guide. And this tape deals with three separate areas. Genetic testing and the counselling and communication that goes with it, paediatrics and end of life. We start with the genetics, uh, genetic testing and the counselling and communication that goes with it because we've converted from CD-ROM, rather confusingly it's called Section 8, but here is the part on genetics, communication and counselling. Section 8 is all about genetic testing and the counselling which people need, both before the genetic test is done and afterwards when the results are available. At the moment, some, perhaps much, of the counselling related to genetic testing is done in specialist units, with clinicians specifically trained in these areas, genetic counsellors and support staff. But there are more and more conditions for which genetic tests may be appropriate, including some of the commoner cancers, and that means that more and more clinicians are going to be asked by their patients about genetic testing. So it's very important for all of us to have some sort of idea about how we would approach the situation. And that's what this section is all about. Perhaps there are three major points that need to be made first of all. It may seem a little bit obvious, but they do need to be emphasised. First of all, there are a large and growing number of medical conditions for which genetic testing may be appropriate metabolic disorders, some degenerative disorders such as Huntington's disease and some cancers such as cancer of the breast, ovary and bowel for example. Second, counselling for genetic tests is very important indeed to reduce the chance of a major conflict if the patient's expectations of the test or of the result are far removed from reality. Third, counselling before and after genetic tests is not easy. Now, of course, the details of the information that you give will depend entirely on the particular condition that we're talking about, the test, and the current recommendations for any treatment. And those details are changing rapidly. So what we know about the risks in condition X after you have a positive test Y is going to change, as are the recommendations for treatment. However, even if those details are changing as rapidly as they actually are, nevertheless, the principles that you need to use for counselling are very important and can help you in your approach. And that's what the next two videotaped scenarios are going to illustrate. The principles, not the details. In many respects, you can think of the counselling before a genetic test as almost like a preparation for potential bad news. It's got certain similarities to any medical interview in which potential bad news information is being discussed. And that means that some of the approaches we've already illustrated on this CD-ROM series will be useful to you. For example, the central principle that before you give information, you ask the patient what she or he thinks about the situation. As in all interviews with detailed medical information, the main thing is to try to do two things at the same time. To give intelligible, accessible information that the person can understand. In other words, draw a map of the forest, don't recite a catalogue of the trees. And at the same time, to focus on what the patient is focused on. To acknowledge and respond to the patient's main list of items, their agenda. Perhaps the most useful and systematic approach to the pre-test counselling interview is based on the six principles you see here, which, as you can see, have got something in common with the main stages of a Breaking Bad News interview. Number one, take an accurate history and family history, including a formal pedigree. Two, ask the patient what he or she thinks about the risk of the condition. In other words, assess the patient's perception. Three, explain the principles of risk assessment and risk management. In other words, how to make sense of the statistics of chance. Number four, give the information about this particular test, particularly explaining the meaning of a positive test, a negative test, or an equivocal test. Then five, Respond to the patient's reactions. 
And finally, six, close the interview, including any other questions and a clear contract for the next contact. In this following scenario, you will see how these main principles can actually help you in practice, how they can give you a framework for a very important discussion. Now we move on to two quite distinct areas, paediatrics and end-of-life care, palliative care, both of which have their own specific communication issues. So what follows now is the paediatric section, then followed by the end-of-life and palliative care section. Section 6 deals with some of the special situations when the patient is a child. In fact, communication in paediatrics is a major area in itself, and we hope that there will be a special CD-ROM set in the future devoted entirely to this subject. But in this section, we can at least open the discussion on some of the issues. Communication with children and with their parents is actually more complicated than direct communication with adults. And for clinicians not usually involved in paediatric practice, it can be very daunting. However, there are perhaps four general guidelines which are often very helpful for those of us who don't communicate with children often. First of all, always have the parent or guardian present for any important interview about the child, unless there is some unavoidable and important reason not to. Second, tailor your level of communication to the level of the child's comprehension, not to the child's chronological age. Some five-year-olds have got a very clear understanding of serious illness, for example. Some nine-year-olds don't. Third, be prepared to repeat what you've said a few times. Children, particularly young ones, often ask people to repeat things several times, not because they want to be irritating, but because they want to find out if you really mean what you've just said. Fourth, and this comes as a surprise to non-paediatric clinicians, be on the alert for what is called magical thinking. Children have a tendency to ascribe the cause of external events to something they did or did not do. You know, I was told to clean up my room, but I didn't, and now mummy is ill, or I'm ill. So watch for signs of magical thinking and that feeling of guilt that the child might experience. Now, in the next scenario, the child is only a few months old. So direct verbal communication with a child is, of course, not possible. But the situation is very difficult because at this routine examination, you have realised that the child has Down's syndrome. Now, this is clearly a very important diagnosis. Therefore, this interview is clearly a Breaking Bad News interview with the added difficulty that the mother's expectations are very high. In this scenario... Note how the SPIKES six-point protocol can be adapted to the paediatric patient and her mother. And that concludes this fifth and final tape in the series uh, Communication Skills in Clinical Practice, a video guide. I genuinely hope that it's been useful, and I also hope that if you would like them, you're sending for the workbooks or the pocket guides, which may help you further. All comments on any of the above are extremely welcome at any time. Thank you.